Eruption is the process of tooth movement from its developmental position in the jaws to a functional position in the oral cavity and involves movement of the tooth through the bone and the oral mucosa to reach the occlusal plane. These movements can be divided into three phases called pre-eruptive, eruptive and post-eruptive phases. Pre-eruptive phase is that phase when the tooth germ moves within the jaws before root formation. The developing tooth germs move in relation to each other and the growing jaws and position themselves for eruption. The eruptive phase, also called as the pre-functional eruptive phase, is when the tooth moves in an occlusal direction from its position in the crypt to appear in the oral cavity in functional occlusal position. The post-eruptive phase, also called as the functional eruptive phase, begins when teeth are in occlusion. The movements in this phase maintain positions of the erupted teeth by accommodating for continued jaw growth and compensating for any proximal or occlusal wear of teeth. So movements to the tooth germs in the pre-eruptive phase are preparatory for the eruptive phase and place them in a position for eruption. The tooth germs grow and move in relation to the growth of the jaws in length, width and height. Now lengthening of the jaws help in anterior tooth germs to move forward or in a mesial direction and the molar tooth germs to move backward or in a distal direction. Simultaneously, the growth of the jaws in width and height move the tooth germs outward or buccally and upward in case of the mandible or downward in case of the maxilla. Permanent tooth germs also move in relation to the primary tooth germs. Initially, permanent tooth germs lie lingual to their primary predecessors and are on the same occlusal plane. But at the end of this phase, pre-eruptive movements finally position the permanent anterior teeth lingual and apical to the primary anterior teeth. And the permanent premolars are positioned under the divergent roots of primary molars. Permanent molars, however, do not have a primary predecessor. The upper permanent molars are positioned with their occlusal surfaces tilted distally and lower molars are tilted mesially. Permanent molars are positioned this way for want of space. And when the jaws grow sufficiently, permanent molars are positioned vertically. Now, pre-eruptive tooth movements are accomplished by bodily movements and an eccentric growth. Bodily movement is that movement of the entire tooth germ and bony remodeling of the crypts help in this process. For example, if a tooth moves mesially, bone resorption occurs on the mesial surface of the bony crypt and deposition of bone occurs on the distal surface, facilitating movement of the entire tooth germ. Eccentric growth is the process of growth in one part of the tooth while the other part of the tooth remains constant. Again, it is a bony remodeling of the crypt that helps in accommodating the growth of the tooth. Now the eruptive phase starts with the initiation of the root formation. It involves the occlusal movement of teeth through the bone and oral mucosa into the oral cavity where they attain functional occlusion. There are several events happening during this phase. Firstly, this phase begins with the initiation of root formation when the epithelial root sheath begins to proliferate. The tooth erupts through the bony crypt and enters the connective tissue. It moves through the connective tissue and makes contact with the oral epithelium. And when this happens, the reduced enamel epithelium covering the tooth crown fuses with the overlying epithelium. The tooth crown then pierces the epithelium and enters the oral cavity. And as it erupts further, the lateral borders of the oral epithelium which fused with the reduced enamel epithelium form the attachment epithelium or the junctional epithelium. So the tooth continues to move occlusally and finally reaches functional occlusion. Now that part of the crown exposed to the oral cavity is called as the clinical crown and that portion of the crown covered by enamel but not exposed to the oral cavity is called anatomic crown. Now it also has to be understood that several changes to tissues happening above, around and below the teeth facilitate movements of the eruptive phase. For teeth to successfully erupt, they have to move through the overlying bone and connective tissue. That is, an eruptive pathway must be established. Only then can they erupt into the oral cavity. 
The reduced enamel epithelium attracts monocytes which differentiate into osteoclasts and resorption of the bony crypt is accomplished by these differentiated osteoclasts. And once this happens, the dental follicle surrounding the tooth becomes continuous with the lamina propria of the overlying oral mucosa. And this portion of the fibrous dental follicle is called as the gubernicular cord and also contains remnants of the dental lamina. The canal housing the gubernicular cord is called as the gubernicular canal. After bone resorption, the reduced enamel epithelium also secretes proteolytic enzymes that degrade the connective tissue in the gubernicular canal as well as the lamina propria of the oral mucosa. So this makes for an eruption pathway for the tooth, thus facilitating eruption. The degradation of blood and nerve vessels along with the connective tissue accounts for the eruption of tooth without bleeding and pain. So as the tooth erupts, epithelial root sheath begins to proliferate and the root starts to form simultaneously. Now initially a bundle of periodontal ligament fibers appears in the cervical area of the tooth root and extend at an angle coronal to the bone. As the tooth erupts and root starts to elongate, the periodontal ligament fibers become more prominent and attach with the root on one side and with the bone on the other. It is speculated that the fibers detach from the tooth as the tooth erupts and then reattach with the tooth to stabilize it. This is hypothesized to happen throughout the eruption process, facilitating eruption. Apart from fibroblasts, periodontal ligament fibers have been reported to harbor a special type of fibroblast called myofibroblasts. And these cells have contractile properties and have been speculated to aid in tooth eruption. The fundic bone or the bone below the tooth germ gives way for root lengthening during this phase. And as the tooth erupts, bone is deposited here in the form of a ladder, often referred to as the bony ladder, to give support to the erupting tooth. After the eruptive phase, the bony ladder is resorbed to give way for the rest of the root to form. And finally, periodontal ligament fibers are established to the apex between the socket floor and the root tip. The post-eruptive phase starts after the teeth reaches functional occlusion. This phase is at its peak during 14 to 18 years of age, though tooth movements in this phase continue to occur till teeth remain in the oral cavity. These movements are slight occlusal and proximal movements that help in keeping the teeth in position despite jaw growth and wearing away of tooth surfaces, be it on the occlusal or on the proximal surfaces. Now when there is too much occlusal wear, there is extra cemental deposition in the apex accompanying the occlusal movement to compensate for the attrition. However, it is not established that the cemental deposition accounts for the occlusal movement. It is in fact not yet clearly known how the tooth moves occlusally post eruption. Also when the teeth are brought together in occlusion, an anteriorly directed force is generated and this accounts for mesial drifting of teeth. Together with this force, it is also speculated that transeptal fibers of the periodontal ligament and soft tissue pressures exerted by the tongue and cheeks may generate a force pushing the teeth mesially.